Hey y'all and welcome back to Voices of Liberation. I am your lovely host, Crystal Seagard, and we have Patience here again with us for another episode. And I'm so happy we got you twice because I know you be busy. <laughs> Thank um, you. Very excited to be here. Oh, we are so excited to have you. Um, as I know with Afrofusion, um, you have your African style of cooking, but you also cook another style of cooking. You want to tell our audience a little bit about that? Yes. As our name implies, Afrofusions, um, you know, we do Southern food as well. As you'll see on this episode, we've got some amazing Southern style fried, uh, you know, chicken, some uh, grits, stone ground grits, my all time favorite, as well as uh, uh, some. Uh, what you got? You got so much food. <laughs> So much food, that's the problem, right? Um, collard greens, yes, collard greens. So very excited to be serving this. Um, it's a little cold, but it's warm in your mouth, so it's going to be good. We're going to dig in. We're going to dig in. My, yep. I have a southern background. My mm -hmm. dad's side of the family is from Louisiana, so mm, you know. Amazing I'm, food. I'm looking forward to it. So let's go to the table so people can find out a little bit more about it. Super excited. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, super excited tonight to be paying homage to Southern American cuisine. Uh, really exciting because when I first came to the US and I landed in North Carolina, the fried chicken and the grits were like the most amazing thing. You know, um, reminded me of our own food like salsa and stew and things like that. So um, this is Afrofusion's own interpretation, right? So we have some southern fried chicken, buttermilk fried chicken. We have some um, collard greens with some bacon, as well as some stone ground cheesy boys. So please enjoy and uh, what I you. Thank you. Hello to you both. As I've stated before we started filming, um, I personally just in terms of how I have grew up in the church and just respect the, the process of titles in, um, and roles in the church will be calling you Pastor Moore and you Reverend Julia in this episode as I would even when we aren't filming. Um, but I'm so happy to have you both here and join this conversation. And let's start off with some intros. You can, you know, say your, state your name and whatever you feel like that to you stands out and is important to your role in this community. I guess I'll go first. I'm Julia Hamilton. I'm the minister of the Unitarian Society here in town, which is a Unitarian Universalist congregation. And uh, I was born here in Isla Vista, and then I moved to New Orleans where I grew up moved kind of all over the country and then found my way unexpectedly back here about 10 years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm like 50% Santa Barbara and 50% a mix of everything else. And uh, my kids grew up here, so uh, they're all in their like 30s. And so we've been here a long time, you know, close to four decades. Um, our... Uh, Church, New Covenant Church is considering a name change to Beloved Community Church. I love it. Yeah. Felt like that would say more mm -hmm. to, to us and to everyone, you know, who knows us. And uh, Diane and I have been married for 44 years as of uh, two weeks ago. And um, um, we, we have watched the seasons change in Santa Barbara uh, from when I was a UCSB student when there was a large, relatively large African-American population uh, here in town, but um, it's not that way anymore, uh, mainly because of gentrification. And, uh, you know, we, at, as students at UCSB, that's when we got to know the black folks uh, here in town. Um, but the students, for the most part, couldn't stay, and, but in this case, even the residents couldn't stay, so we've kind of lost track of one another, many of us. Some of us are in touch, especially because of social media. So I'm sure you both can tell um, by your introductions of the connection you two have, and um, I don't know if we call it, is it a career? Would you consider like ministry? Yeah. yeah. 
um, the connections you two have had within your career, why I invited you to have this conversation with me. Um, I have so many questions just around like religion and its intersections um, and specifically how it has changed and how some communities have even started to weaponize, um, you know, religion and just faith in God and the Bible and, and so many things around that. But before we get into that, um, I kind of want to hear a little bit about how you two got into, was it, it, would ministry be correct? Mm -hmm. Ministry? Yeah. Well, I don't know how, how you ended up being a colleague of mine, but um, so I grew up Unitarian Universalist, which is unusual because it's a pretty small tradition. And uh, when I moved to New Orleans with my mom and my stepdad, they started looking around for a community in a new town and said, uh, well, you should go check out the Unitarian Church. That's where all of the liberal folks hang out. <laughs> so that's how they ended up going there. So that's where I was raised. And I was very active in the youth group and went to national conferences and then never had any idea that I was going to wind up a minister. I uh, went into theater and <laughs> had a great time for a while and then eventually ended up moving to New York and got a job as an office manager at a Unitarian Universalist congregation across from Central Park. And that's where I started paying attention and I had an amazing woman who was the mentor to me there um, and kind of saw what ministry was beyond just Sunday morning and saw kind of the fullness of the job and realized that I really cared about um, being with people through their lives and about the impact that a community could make on the world, you know, a community of goodwill could make on the world and headed off to seminary. So that's how I ended up a minister. How did you get here? Well, mm, I did not anticipate this uh, when I was going to college. I was hoping to go into uh, um, news journalism, uh, uh, TV news journalism and I was a communication studies major at UCSB. Um, but I had a change of life, course of life. I found myself speaking to youth groups all over California, south and north. And um, so it kind of created a space for me by, without me trying. And, um, and then I began to understand what I was a part of and had to make some distinctions, uh, make some decisions, because American civil religion uh, has a big role in, um, in the genocide of, uh, of uh, native populations. And uh, of course, we've been hearing in the news lately of um, the recovery of uh, the remains of uh, residential school students. Um, and so I found myself, be that I, I found out that I'm a part, I'm in the middle of something that um, that doesn't represent my values, you know? And, uh, and so I, I found redemption because there are, there are people who, uh, especially theologians, th uh, liberation theologians, uh, you know, James Cone, black liberation, uh, a lot of Latin American theologians, Dalit theologians in this Indian subcontinent, uh, indigenous Japanese, the Buraku people. I began to read their writings and and I learned that, um, you know, being a Christian is not what the culture thinks it is. <laughs> it's always a perpetual state of resistance to the dominance and the status quo. That's powerful. And I think some connection I made between what each of you stated is that you were called, called to do this work. And I think so many people have that same story. And Pastor Moore, you talked about um, theology. And I know I shared with you before that I started following um, a black femme theologian that has really opened up my eyes in ways I get to look at being a Christian and, and being a Christian woman and even in terms of how I can believe in God and question things. But can you define theology? Because I'm going to be honest, I still don't know what it means. I just know she's a theologist, a theologian, but I don't know what it means. You know, I think uh, most people are theologians and, and they don't know it um, because uh, we're, we're healers. Um, and lovers, and I think that uh, the the only distinction would be that some of us go to school to study what we're what we're doing as a species. You know, would you say that? Yeah, I mean, everybody makes meaning out of their lives, right? To me, theology is just how you identify what's ultimate, what is most important, what is worthy of investing your whole self, 
and, and then constructing sort of meaning and purpose, to me that's doing theology. And the definition that you might have of God or the divine, those are all personal. Every single person is gonna have a different definition for God and the divine in their life. And theology is just our process of articulating that for ourselves and then figuring out how it impacts the way we live. So it sounds like it evolves and it's really about having this evolving compass of like empathy and care um, and a belief in, in something bigger than yourself almost. Yeah. yeah, and looking at things in terms of that. Um, and I guess it's a great segue to what I wanna talk about next with, so we all know, right, Black Lives Matter movement <laughs> goes global. But along with that conversation, which I kept, I wanna say having issues with digesting or accepting is the issues around like religion and God and how much the Bible in general and Christianity, especially specifically white Christianity, has been used for centuries to harm communities, especially communities of color, especially the black community. Um, and it had me sitting with like, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I grew up in Baptist church. My grandma had me there every Sunday, youth choir, spring sings, all that. Like I was in everything, Christmas programs, Easter programs. And so that's all I knew, right? And now I'm I'm coming up as an activist and an organizer and I'm being in spaces with people um, of different religions or people that are atheists or people, but we're still sharing space, right? And we're respecting each other. Um, but I guess that what I want to ask you both is how did it feel really, um, you know, specifically for folks in your industry as you started to see that conversation shift away? Because I, I saw a lot of people like criticizing the Bible, criticizing people believing in God or questioning our religion. And it had me, you know, sort of in this space of, I'm gonna be honest, is God real? Like, I never asked myself that until I'm now being challenged to ask myself that because there's other people out here that have, you know, are bringing forth these new narratives. And so how did that feel for you um, as, as a ministers and, and pastors in your field as theologians? Um, and then also, how did you, you shift to sort of evolve and invite that conversation into your church spaces? That was loaded, so. <laughs> well, I think we probably have different answers because we serve very different communities. And in, in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, it's a big tent. So we don't have a statement of faith. We don't have a creed or a dogma that everyone ascribes to. Everyone is responsible for their own spiritual journey, their own set of beliefs, and we come together more as a group of people who are interested in figuring out how do we live in this life and not worry so much about what happens after we die, right? That we have a chance to make the world better here and now for each other, um, and that whatever beliefs we hold individually, our, our primary um, responsibility is to each other. And so we come together with that in common, not necessarily a same definition of God and or the divine or the afterlife. And so it, that's been part of the congregation's um, whole history. So I, it, I didn't have to introduce that conversation. That, that's already been alive. But religious wounds are real things. And people are always coming through the door carrying deep injuries um, that have been done to them in communities of faith and in religious institutions. And so there is always work, whether it's shame around LGBTQ um, and other issues around sex and sexuality that where they've been told that they're wrong or, or shameful, um, or there's a huge trust issue if trust has been violated, or just the colonial history of the church um, weighs heavy. And so it's always this process of like sorting out, well, what's worth keeping and what do we let go of? And you don't have to hold on to every word in the Bible to be inspired by the stories and the history of it, there's a, this constant like sifting that I think everybody's going through right now. Yeah, the, um, I've heard uh, African-American theologians and other academics refer to our song tradition as the Third Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have the Hebrew script, well, we just call it the First Testament, Second Testament, and the Third Testament because this one captures both the, the horror 
you know, the, the loss, the, the humiliation uh, these songs do, but they also um, restore hum uh, dignity and hope because really the song tradition I is in code. Um, and, you know, one example is that, you know, for generations, uh, some of us in our churches sing, uh, woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. But then uh, when it was time to, um, to be a little bolder, we said what we really meant all the time, <laughs> woke up this with my morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Uh, that was what we were saying from the beginning. Uh, you know, when we were out in the fields, my, rel my ancestors picking tobacco, um, that kind of thing. Um, that we, 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 we have pain and we have hope, and that really is the essence. Uh, it kind of corresponds to what you were saying about how do you, how do you live in this world now? Um, and so it's one of the reasons that I, we are entertaining the, the new name for our community, Beloved Community, because um, it's almost a response, an answer to the building, the re, the, the uh, fortification of the silos that you're talking about, where people are saying, no, we're the only ones. Uh, basically, it's American civil religion. It is, it is uh, not really true religion. If you c come down to it, it's nationalism mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with religious flavors to it. So um, our, our answer to that is, uh, that's not us. We're a beloved community, which is completely inclusive um, you know, the history of the idea of the beloved community. And, and there are expressions of it through, throughout the world. The, the beloved community exists. It doesn't get the press, right? <laughs> you know, the, it's, the, it's, it's the bad ones, so, you know, the, the oppressors who get the press, the ones who, the fundamentalists who, uh, you know, we're the, you have to do it the way that we do it, and, uh, and you have to do it the white way. You know, when we think about, too, historically, specifically, what black churches stood for, right? It was social justice and activism, like so much organizing was coming out of the church. Um, and then that changed over the years, and it was intentional, right? White supremacy is intentional. Um, and in terms of speaking about, you know, organizing but also in the church, what ways do you both feel? And I've attended service with you, so I, I have witnessed ways that you are inviting it to your church, and I haven't had a chance, but I will come to one of your services. But what ways um, um, are your churches, or do you feel like other churches can really um, start embedding some of those, those social justice and organizing practices back into service? I feel like it's embedded in everything that I do because I can't separate out the desire for the beloved community or the desire for justice in the world with the way that I live in other aspects. And I think that's part of what the community of the con or the congregation is working on is like this is building real relationships, building places where you can be vulnerable, you can do your own internal work. Um, it's a predominantly white congregation, although not entirely. And so working with the challenge of, of working with um, a congregation say, we have to do our work before we can go out into the world um, and cause more harm, right? So first mitigate harm, and that means sitting with yourself, sitting with your history, with the programming that you got as a child, and trying to figure out where you can sort and sift through your own um, assumptions before you can um, build real relationships. And so that creating a space where, um, sort of a countercultural space where people can do this work that there may be no other place in their life where there's a space for that. And they can do it multi-generationally, right? So we're not just talking about grown-ups, we're talking about kids and families and elders and people in all phases of life being together. That's also something that's different about a religious community than in a lot of other spaces where um, we're so segregated generationally in our world right now. Um, and this community then is the one that when things happen, we can mobilize and we can mobilize together. I mean, this is one of the things that I love working in this town with you is that it feels like it's, it's not work that I ever do alone and it's not work that our congregation ever does alone, but we do in solidarity and in, in a real relationship. 
And in, 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 in this process of mitigation that's, that ha is happening, does it happen during Sunday service or is there like group meetups, Bible study? <laughs> Um, both and, right? So sometimes it happens on Sunday morning. Um, sometimes we have uh, classes. We went through a whole series called Beloved Conversations, which is a structured um, adult religious education program, you know, learning to talk about race and racism and white supremacy. And um, there's small breakout groups and there's affinity groups. You know, there's a racial justice reading group that talks as there's so much great um, literature and writing and thinking right now uh, in the world and how do sorry just no, to, how do people get in involved in these these work groups or is it just by attending Sunday service or it's basically of all voluntary right I can't make anybody do anything I learned that early on in ministry <laughs> all I can do is is try to create it's like setting a table right it's like gathering around a table you can set a table and you can make a feast and then you can invite people and you hope they show up and if you set a good table um, and you prepare it with love, then hopefully people will attend. But you can't, you know, you have to just kind of make a space for it and hope that people follow what I think is that longing inside all of us. You make it sound easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, yes, I agree that it, it's all voluntary, but it's interesting how many times you need to volunteer people who want to volunteer, but they're not going to do it if you just put a, a you know, something on the on the bulletin board saying you know whoever would like to do this they don't respond to that so yeah. well you know so you have to really get to know people not just uh, as the the leader or the clergy person but the community needs to know needs to know each other so that they can give release to the people who want to be active in some way but they don't know how to do it so uh, one way is modeling it, which it, you do a great job of. You know, you represent it. Um, you are, you know, you are a person I know. If nobody else shows up, like, oh, well, Julia's going to be there. That's for sure. Uh, that is true. <laughs> that's a, that's really the way I feel about it. Um, in fact, someone someone mentioned uh, when we were at Bread and Roses, someone suggested that there be a a, a clergy of the year award. And I said, well, I told Julia, I said, why, wh you would win it every year. I mean, wh who else is gonna take that? That's, I hear that, I hear that. And um, it's interesting to even think about how I met you two, right? It was in organizing, it wasn't through the church first. <laughs> um, and I think sometimes outside of that organizing community, so many people just, or have had um, interactions with you through ministry, and I only know you to be organizers, <laughs> um, and how and how beautiful it is for y'all to show up in these spaces radically. I mean, I know um, at the start of Healing Justice, at that beautiful um, protest, you both spoke, and and that will forever be remembered and embedded in like the core values of Healing Justice and and who supports this community, stands up for the black community, um, and who continues to share space with us even after all these years. Um, and I just wanna say, I see that beautiful Black Lives Matter sign right in front of the church <laughs> every time I pass, and that means something. It does not mean something for a majority, um, I wanna say a majority population of the church being white. It, it means a lot to, to have that um, I'm there. And, I remember my friend reached out to me and said, do you know anything about this church? And I was like, yes, that's Reverend Julia, you gotta go. <laughs> um, and just always appreciating, you know, sharing space with you both. And I wish we could talk forever, but before uh, we end this conversation, I want to hand off the mic to you both for any, you know, wrap up conversations or anything that's really pressing on your heart that you want our audience to know. I have to talk about the banner because we just did a rededication of that banner this Sunday because it has been up for a little over a year and it got torn down for the first time a week ago. And we ordered two when we put it up because we knew that this was a possibility, a likelihood perhaps even at some point somebody was going to try to make their argument um, through coming in the middle of the night or whatever and tearing it down. 
Um, and, and so we um, had a rededication ceremony on Sunday and recommitted ourselves to supporting and continuing the work of saying Black Lives Matter over and over and over again, <laughs> as long as we have to, and reminding the congregation that putting it up there is not just a statement about racial justice or um, anti-racism work, but it's also a commitment to following black leadership on the issue. It's a, it's a sign of solidarity and that leadership comes through a community but is not from the community, you know, um, and so, having it up there is not just a reminder to the world, but it's a constant reminder to the congregation I serve that the work is ongoing. And I'm so grateful that it wasn't even a thought about putting it back up again. It was just, okay, well, when are we gonna put this up? How are we gonna do this? And they're just jumping right back into it. So it continues. Thank you for doing that. I, I would just say concerning our community, um, that uh, the, the, the church is constituted with people who, who are activists. And so, uh, you know, in a variety of ways, um, they are doing the work as a part of their life, as a, you know, what, what, and so when, when we convene, it's more of an encouragement to remind us that we are, we are dismantling white supremacy. And our congregation has a pretty good constituent, well, probably majority white, but uh, we, you know, there are folks who are brown and Asian. Um, and we are reminding ourselves of what we're dealing with. And that in itself, it meets a need in people's lives because people are getting it from every side. They're taking hits uh, throughout the course of the week and they're wondering, is my work in vain? Am I wasting my time? And then we come together and we see each other and we're like, oh yeah, we can do this. We'll go back out there and do some more. Mm -hmm. And again, would love to have this conversation for so long, um, and, but I do want people to understand if they are interested how to uh, attend the service. I know Pastor Moore, is it now, is the name change a definite? Is it, or is it still, they would find you by new, searching New Covenant Church? Yeah, it's still, yeah, um, you know, the, the name change is likely, but, um, and maybe inevitable, I probably can venture that. But uh, right now we're still completely virtual. We're gonna have a, a, a test run in person on the 19th of December. Uh, but if people do look for us, they will need to search for New Covenant Church. Yeah, um, on, you can search on Facebook. They stream services live on Facebook. They also have an Instagram where they post uh, speakers that they're inviting weekly. And then your Sunday service is? We are both online and in person. So we've just now, I think we just did our fourth service back with people in the sanctuary. So, but we still wanna hold on to, the, to being careful and safe as possible. Um, and so giving people the option of continuing to join us online or continuing or starting to come back in person. And just by searching so, Santa Barbara. Yeah, Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. And um, we also are on Facebook on Sundays or on YouTube um, or in person, come by and say hi. And you know, bo uh, both of us, you can probably find us if you just put Julia Hamilton, Santa Barbara, right? right? Yeah. Uh, that David Moore, kind of Santa Barbara. Perfect. Well, thank you both for, I always like to just hold hands around the table um, and just look you both in the eyes and say thank you so much for sharing space. Thank you so much for continuing to show up for this community. Um, thank you for um, being in my life. And I've, I've learned from sharing space with you both. And I just, I really appreciated this conversation and your time. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning into Voices of the Liberation.